Fanny Bryce was a woman ahead of her time. In an era where men were funny and women were relegated to supporting roles, she fearlessly took center stage. Her characters made her wildly popular, and under the bright lights, no man could stand in her way. Yet in her personal life, that's all men seem to do. Beyond the glitz and glamour, Bryce harbored secrets that would surprise even her most ardent admirers, and a twisted side that only Hollywood's most elites were privy to behind closed doors. Indeed, at formal events, Bryce would often do something so disgusting it left fellow guests shocked. But what could possibly have transpired to tarnish the image of such a revered entertainer? Join us as we uncover the life and secrets of the comedic genius that was Fanny Bryce. Fanny Bryce was born Fanya Borak on October 29, 1891, in Manhattan. She was one of four children, and their upbringing was anything but ordinary. Her parents owned saloons, where entertainment flowed as freely as the drinks. The saloons made heaps of money, but there was one problem. Two problems, actually. Her father, a heavy drinker, and gambler. These vices ultimately prompted her mother to sell the saloons, uprooting Fanny and her siblings to Brooklyn. And it would be there, in Brooklyn, at Keeney's Theater, where young 15-year-old Fanny Bryce would not only enter, but win the amateur talent show. This would serve as a spark, igniting her path to stardom. Fresh off her talent show victory, Bryce was convinced that her future was in show business. She made the drastic decision to quit school and pursue her dreams. But the start of her journey was wrought with disappointment when she landed her first theater job. Instead of working in the glamorous world of theater, she was working in a theater, a cinema, as an assistant in the projection room. Needless to say, this was not going to be the big break that she had hoped for, so she scored an audition for a role in the chorus of a Broadway show and got the part. But yet again, this wasn't going to be her big break either when the company fired her for never bothering to learn how to dance. Though at the time, Bryce lied and told people it was her skinny legs that cost her the job. Bryce didn't seem to have a place in show business, until that is, she discovered the comedic world of burlesque and everything changed. Fanny Bryce, slim and tall with distinguished and expressive facial features, was perfect for burlesque, where getting a laugh was paramount. In fact, all Bryce really had to do to send the audience into hysterics was walk onto the burlesque stage. It was her off look that secured her a role in the show, College Girl. The show went on tour, and Bryce, still a teenager at the time, did something no teenager should ever do. The College Girl Tour made a stop in Springfield, Massachusetts, where Bryce met a barber named Frank White. The pair fell madly in love and spontaneously tied the knot before she even left Springfield. But Bryce instantly knew that she had made a terrible mistake. On paper, Bryce's first marriage lasted a couple years. In reality, she had ended it after only a few days. Though the relationship ended as quickly as it had started, it would serve as a foreshadowing of Bryce's tumultuous love life that lie ahead. Fanny Bryce was soon back in New York working on honing her craft. This was at a time when the use of ethnic stereotypes was commonplace, but nothing that Bryce tried felt quite right. Then her friend and songwriter, Irving Berlin, gave her a life-changing suggestion that would prove monumental in shaping the trajectory of her career. Berlin proposed that Bryce use a Jewish accent in her acts. He even had a song for her about a Jewish girl. Although Bryce was Jewish, she had never considered using this as the basis of her comedy. She soon mastered her fake accent, crossed her eyes, and came up with a slice of honeydew melon smile to top it all off. This clown-like character became a huge hit, and Bryce soon garnered the attention of one of the most powerful names in theater. None other than Florenz Ziegfeld. Ziegfeld was the king of show business and a man with the ability to launch Fanny Bryce's career. As such, when Bryce received a telegram for a meeting with the legend himself, she automatically assumed that it was a joke. But nope, 
This was the real deal. A two-year deal with the Ziegfeld Follies, and Bryce didn't have to give the contract a second thought. Though she did have to embarrassingly ask for a second copy of the contract after the first one suffered a little too much wear and tear amidst her excitement. Bryce was soon causing a sensation working with Ziegfeld and earning a lot of money to follow suit. Though, this cash seemed to be lining someone else's pocket. Enter Nikki Arnstein, a professional gambler and a man who actually already had a wife and a reputation as a crook. This should have been enough red flags to send Fanny Bryce running for the Hollywood Hills. But she wasn't deterred and actually allowed him to move in with her. This only proved to be a short stay, though, as he was heading to prison for wiretapping. Bryce was desperate to get him off the hook and quickly started the appeal process. But the one thing about appeals? They're expensive. And though Bryce was earning a pretty penny at this point, she wasn't earning get-your-partner-out-of-prison money. But that didn't stop Bryce, and she soon went broke trying, even going so far as to pawn off her jewelry. In the end, the appeal failed, and Arnstein was sent to the dangerous Sing Sing prison. Fanny Bryce continued to visit Arnstein every week until his wife found out, lawyered up, and took Bryce to court for alienation of affection. After losing her rights to visit Arnstein, Bryce's mission to get him out of prison became even more desperate. This time, instead of going for an appeal, she went for a pardon. And got it. Arnstein was now free, in more ways than one, with his wife giving him a divorce. In 1918, Bryce and Arnstein became man and wife, and two months later, welcomed their daughter Frances into the world. Their young family soon built a life of luxury on Bryce's dime, and most people wondered what she saw in Arnstein. One of these people being Bryce's mother, who saw the relationship for what it was, a twisted deja vu of her own marriage. Much like the old saying goes, women marry their fathers. But as the other old saying goes, when life gives you lemons, make your next big career move. Is that the saying? Anyways, this tumultuous relationship actually laid the groundwork for Bryce to make the incredible leap from comedy to drama. Thanks to Ziegfeld, Bryce found herself venturing outside of her typical comedic repertoire and instead singing a heartfelt ballad titled My Man, which would go on to become a huge hit and her signature song. Audiences were in awe of Fanny Bryce's versatility. But with lyrics such as, cost me a lot, but there's one thing that I've got, it's my man, it's pretty easy to see where the real drama was coming from. It was true, Arnstein had cost Bryce a lot, but the real question was whether Arnstein was worth the expense or the crime. In 1920, an elaborate failed robbery attempt had Nikki Arnstein's name written all over it. And when authorities came a knocking, Arnstein went a running. Nothing screams, I'm guilty, more than running away from the police. Yet when detectives turned to Bryce for information on her husband as the heist mastermind, her response? Nikki Arnstein couldn't mastermind an electric light bulb into a socket. With Arnstein still AWOL, Bryce gave birth to their son, William. And it would seem Arnstein would yet again lose out on Father of the Year. Maybe. That's not a fact. That's just a guess. I don't know. Around the same time, Bryce made a second visit to the hospital for something that was quite rare at the time. Plastic surgery. Because what better time to get a new nose than when your husband is on the lam? Arnstein did turn himself in, eventually, but only when a business associate paid his bail. After that, freedom came at a price, and Fanny Bryce was yet again going to be the one footing the bill. She fought tooth and nail for four years to keep Arnstein out of prison. But in the end, it wasn't enough, and Arnstein ended up spending 14 months behind bars. This would bring their relationship full circle in more ways than one. You see, after prison, Arnstein's cheating ways went into overdrive. Over the years, Bryce had known about his affairs with younger women, but in 1927, she found out something that would push her over the edge once and for all. Arnstein was cheating with someone older and richer than her, and with that... Bryce decided that she had had enough and wanted a divorce. When asked, Arnstein blamed Bryce's beauty for his transgressions, stating that with such a perfect nose, he felt uncomfortable in her presence and started having affairs with women who were not so good looking. Bryce had finally gotten rid of the bad boy in her life, but there was another guy waiting in the wings. 
In 1929, Fanny Bryce met Billy Rose, a lyricist and producer of theatrical shows. Despite their differences in age and stature, Rose being eight years younger and much shorter than Bryce, the two tied the knot. Rose didn't seem to mind living in Bryce's shadow, literally and figuratively. Nor did he seem to mind people calling him Mr. Fanny Bryce, or when Bryce called him a little shrimp. What he did mind was when Bryce forgot his name on multiple occasions. But I think we can all agree, remembering your spouse's name isn't too much to ask. This humiliation stuck with Rose, and it seemingly became his mission to etch his name into the limelight. Rose went on to produce Billy Rose's Crazy Quilt and Billy Rose's Aquacade. He also opened a nightclub called Billy Rose's Diamond Horseshoe. But in Rose's effort to shine, something else came to light. A heated love affair that he was having with Eleanor Holm, an Olympic swimmer featured in Billy Rose's Aquacade production. Scandal had yet again struck in Fanny Bryce's love life. She went on to call Rose the most evil man she'd ever known and filed for divorce in 1938. Bryce, realizing that she was no good with men, came up with the reason as to why. She was just too direct for most of them. Fanny Bryce's romantic connections never seemed to stand the test of time. But one thing that did? Bryce's character, Baby Snooks. Inspired by an odd-looking baby named Snookums, featured in The Newlyweds, a comic strip created by artist George McManus in 1904. Bryce's portrayal of Baby Snooks wasn't just a role. It was a transformation. She immersed herself in the character, donning baby clothes both on stage and for radio recordings. She even took it one step further and had her scripts printed in extra large type so she wouldn't have to wear glasses. Because what baby wears glasses? Not baby snooks, or schnooks, as Bryce would say. The laughter of audiences echoed across the airwaves as baby snooks became a sensation and landed Bryce a single billing on a CBS radio show from 1944 to 1951. Why? Just don't, that's all. What's the matter with his hair? Nothing. This was revolutionary as women always played second fiddle to men when it came to comedy. At first, Baby Snooks proved perfect for the conservative landscape of radio, not having any obvious ethnicity or off-color humor. But innocent Baby Snooks soon became the center of controversy with the rise of juvenile delinquency in America. What started as a harmless character was soon seen as a child learning how to misbehave while teaching others to do the same. The tide had turned, and it was the beginning of the end for Baby Snooks. But nobody puts Baby in a corner. To this day, some historians believe that Bryce's Baby Snooks continues to live on through television, with the TV comedy trend of mischievous children challenging their authority figures. Who knows, without Baby Snooks, we may not have had shows like Leave It to Beaver, My Three Sons, or even The Simpsons. After theater and radio, starring in movies seemed like the next obvious career move, but Bryce never made the leap, likely owing to Bryce's own belief that she didn't have a face for film. In fact, she famously quipped that if anyone pointed a camera at her and yelled action, the camera would have stood up and walked away. It wasn't until after Bryce's passing in 1951 from a massive cerebral hemorrhage that she would make it to the silver screen, with Hollywood deciding that Bryce's story needed telling. It wasn't long before they would learn that one film just wasn't going to be enough. In the end, it would take two films to do Bryce's story justice. Funny Girl and its sequel, Funny Lady. Both would be produced by none other than the husband of Bryce's daughter, Frances, film producer, Ray Stark. Once the ball was rolling, Frances would prove to be an annoying obstacle for the filmmakers, becoming obsessed with keeping her mother's reputation clean. As it turned out, she wasn't the only person who didn't want the film to tell the truth. Bryce's ex-husband, Nicky Arnstein, was adamant that he not come across as the common crook in his portrayal, even going so far as to have a lawyer on standby. In spite of these obstacles, both films went on to thrill critics and audiences, and the films even served to launch the careers of those who starred in them, most notably Barbara Streisand. Streisand's portrayal of Fanny Bryce set the bar so high that it gave rise to major casting drama in 2022 with the Broadway production of Funny Girl. 
Many stars lined up vying for the lead role and the chance to walk in Bryce's shoes. However, the opportunity would come down to two. In one corner, Beanie Feldstein. In the other, Leah Michelle. Although Feldstein would come out victorious, critics and audiences wouldn't take to her singing voice. With revenue hurting, producers saw something in the Feldstein-Michelle rivalry, so they brought on Michelle and ticket sales soared. Fanny Bryce was a once-in-a-lifetime talent who lived many lives. But who was she beyond her public persona? Stories from Bryce's collection of famous friends have helped to shed light on who Fanny Bryce was behind the curtain. Many of her peers sang high praises, describing Bryce as authentic and unpretentious with a knack for decorating. Catherine Hepburn once said Bryce's number one characteristic was her elegance. According to Bryce herself, Famous people liked her because she didn't treat them any differently. Though this wasn't completely true, for there's one story of a time when the Prince of Wales paid a visit and Bryce insisted that he sit in a particular chair. When asked why, she told the prince that when she went to sell it, she'd get twice the price. Clearly, she loved to clown around, but sometimes this went a little too far, and there was one social behavior that many found completely repulsive. Imagine this. A starlet of the highest order, adorned in the finest gowns, gracing formal events with her presence. Yet when the time came for dinner, she would leave guests utterly scandalized when she spat out her glamorous white teeth, completely fake, and replaced them with her choppers, the ones for eating. Shameless and unapologetic. But that was Fanny Bryce for you. And this was her wild story. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe for even more astonishing facts about the world's most iconic figures.